Hello, friends, and welcome to the weekly sacrifice we perform to stop Argog, the pain god, from rising and eating us all. I'm Joe. I'm David. And I'm Chris. And together uh, we are Wild Stallions. I, I didn't have anywhere else to go from there. That was it. You don't need anywhere else to go. Like, that's that's it. That's the peak. Yeah. End the show. <laughs> I think uh, I think we broke Joe. Or, you know, I'm going to assume that something weird happened on his end, but I say let's just roll with it. Uh, let's just pretend that Joe is talking. It's not that he's paralyzed head to toe. <laughs> That's not the reality. That's not what's happening. There is no Fugu venom anywhere involved in this. That's correct. Yeah, and uh, when, when I feed Joe his food, it's not like it dribbles out his ch- He's eating. He's going to live. Yeah. He won't die. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what's going on, but we're going to talk about mazes and monsters one last time. Once more into the breach, old friends. Yup, it's the part where shit gets real. We're deep into the LARPing cave, so. (laughs) I'll get deep in your LARP cave. Oh my. Imagine that you're a war veteran and you survived World War II and like you saw all that stuff and then you come back home and a few years later, like you see a chick track talking about how... Dungeons and Dragons is gonna ruin. You have everything. you don't know how time works. No idea what history <laughs> is, do you? Like, you, you, do you recognize that World War II ended in the 1940s? It's just and one chick long track... present that you've read about on Wikipedia. <laughs> and the chick track is like like 60s, 70s, right? 80s, 80s, 80s. 80s. Absolutely, the 80s. Maybe like the 70s, but I don't years feel like it. Separating them. Okay, well, regardless, you're like, a, or no, no, you survive Vietnam. There you then, go. That's and, a more salient reference. <laughs> you survive Vietnam, you get home, and then like, D&D's gonna ruin everything. And you're just like, this is what I fought for. This, this is... <laughs> you ever seen uh, First Blood? Yeah. Great movie. No, but I saw part of it. I remember very vividly from a young age when he was describing his experience upon returning from Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Like, that stuck with me. Yeah. I should watch yeah. the whole thing again. You should. It's a great movie. Yeah. And then they made sequels that completely missed the point of the yep. original. Just like Charles Bronson and Death Wish. It's true, actually. I... Yeah. Anyway, Mazes yep. and Monsters. It's a book. It's a book. Kind it's of, wild. Maybe. If you're desperate. Yeah. We're going to dive into that. Uh, I don't know. Whatever. Fuck it. Go to wegiveyoubrainworms.com. And give us your money. Give us your money to keep doing this. It'll be great. <laughs> or, you know, give us your money and we'll promise to stop? Eventually. I mean, yeah. I, I'll totally accept money to just stop <laughs> oh putting God. out content. Joe should, Joe, should we have a $1 million incentive? And if it's you our give it to us, we stop. $50 a month, we stop recording this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just set out a million dollars a month to pay us not to do it. Oh, I want that to be a It's thing amazing we have how so much bad. more easily I can be bought than you. Wow. <laughs> uh, does anybody have anything good or meaningful to say? Or should we just do this? Does anyone have anything good or meaningful to say, or should we make a podcast? Like Where we read home? mazes and monsters, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Let's just do this thing. Let's just go, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, let's read about Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, JJ said, unless you write the textbook yourself. It doesn't matter, Kate said, suddenly depressed again. I'm never going to be a famous writer, or any kind at all. How can you say that? We're all going to be famous. That's the plan. Whose plan? Mine, JJ said. Then you'll have to get rid of my writer's block. I can't be a writer if I don't write anything. Have you tried drugs? <laughs> I have. Didn't help. <laughs> hey, it worked for Stephen King. Yeah. I think, honestly, Stephen King probably did drugs to keep himself from just writing forever. Stephen King did drugs so that he would have other things to do besides <laughs> write. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it became kind of an Ouroboros, I think, past a certain... Yeah. Also, I like that Stephen King doesn't take himself so seriously. Oh, yeah. yeah, Stephen King's a cool guy. I think so, yeah. Also, his book on writing is a tremendous thing to read if you have any ambitions of being a writer. I highly recommend it. Or just someone who wants to understand the creative impulse. Or just if you want to understand Stephen King. Yeah. You'll think of things. Right now you're at school. There's too much input from other sources. 
Maybe. She sipped her coffee. How are your plans for the new game going? Fantastic. Just wait. I worry about you at night, JJ. I know you're in the caverns all alone. He was touched. She, his love, his friend, worried about him. He wished he had brought her something better than coffee, but it was what he'd had left from his evening in the caverns and it had been a spur-of-the-moment idea to share it with her. You don't have to worry, he said. I'm careful, and I know my way around pretty well by now. You couldn't. They're too big. The pyramids were not built in a day. May I quote you? They laughed. It was a matter of pride with both of them never to say anything banal unless it was on purpose. This is weird dialogue. Yep. Yeah. You know what I was thinking, JJ? You're almost halfway through college and you want to be an actor, but you've never taken an acting class. I know, he said calmly. That's what I want them to think. <laughs> but why not? He thought about it. It wasn't to spite his father, because his father didn't care. It wasn't because he was afraid of competition. He knew he was good. Why then? I guess, J.J. said finally, it's because I have the game. I don't need anything else. It's not the same, Kate said. Yes, it is. He told her then about his feelings in the caverns, how he was the producer, scriptwriter, set designer, and everyone else. If this was true, if like D&D could supplement everything that you need in your life, we wouldn't have incels. I mean... No, because you wouldn't need sex anymore. You have the game. Hey, I think it's unfair to say that every incel plays D&D. Oh, no, no that, that's not what I'm saying, but hmm. I don't even know. What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> Talking about, we're, we're switching between reading a propaganda piece and talking about art <laughs> do you ever have existential crises for just stupid reasons do you ever have existential crises over the number of existential crises you have because <laughs> i do oh, yeah. <laughs> i had a moment the other day because it was like three in the morning i had just gotten done working on this and i was eating chips and salsa not quite directly out of the refrigerator but not too far from it and a chip broke off in the salsa and I had this moment where I was like, I broke a really hard thing in a really soft thing. What's even the point of me? <laughs> <laughs> and I just kind of sat there like that for a minute. And somehow this book, and specifically this passage, this conversation that they're having, evoked similar feelings. <laughs> just... Broke something very hard inside of you with yeah. something very soft. I... <laughs> You know, all the time we are faced with the implication of like, what happens if this podcast fails? Because that's the most likely outcome. Sure. But like, w have we considered what does it mean if we succeed? That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what even <laughs> is success? Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> this is what happens when Kane isn't here. <laughs> right. We get real esoteric. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. We're in our feels again. <laughs> Kane crowns us in reality. <laughs> Kane will suffer no bullshit. Mm. He told her then about his feelings in the caverns, how he was the producer, scriptwriter, set designer, and everyone else. Most of us actors end up wanting to do everything else too, he said. We like the power. Maybe then you won't be an actor after all. Maybe you'll be a director or a producer, she said. She sounded rather pleased. You really have the soul of an entrepreneur. You know, I read something the other day that just made me stop and question everything in my life uh -huh. not quite so like 3 a.m emotional journey dark night of the soul as your broken chip in the salsa <laughs> but apparently there's a woman who is a professional dungeon master uh -huh. like D, D dungeon master not the other kind right right that's an important distinction who makes 45 grand a year jesus to play D D. I don't make that for my job and I hate my job. Yeah. And I have to wonder what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> like, <laughs> why am I not just running D&D &D games for strangers? It's not like they would care. It's true. Um, I could play the same game. Just make one game, one campaign, plot out a bunch of different encounters and just run it in four hour sessions, three nights a week. Maybe you could get in contact with that lady and find out how she started. Yeah, right. I don't know. But I, it, the truth of the matter is that I would not want to do that because D&D &D is something I enjoy. And yeah, I don't want once to you suck it. all the fucking yeah. passion out of playing it. Have you ever tried doing it professionally? 
Well, no, because doing it professionally wasn't really a thing that could happen until like four years ago. Yeah. Well, there is the threat that it'll suck all the the, the fun out of it, or it could be a very richly rewarding experience. You have to try it. Well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I don't know. <laughs> I probably won't, but I'll talk about seeing what I can do <laughs> here where I'm recorded, and lots of people will hear me say it. Fuck. <laughs> You really have the soul of an entrepreneur. I could star in my own movies, he said. I'd write in a part for myself. Maybe just a cameo, but effective. Or a lead. It would depend on how I felt. Yeah, great, you'd be Woody Allen. Or fucking Quentin Tarantino. Mm -hmm. Those guys are everyone's idea of well-adjusted personal... Yup. Yeah. Yeah. (sighs) Sometimes I dread life after college, Kate said. I absolutely refuse to settle for a Sometimes boring job. Sometimes I dread life, period. Don't let me, JJ. If you see me copping out, you remind me how when we were at Grant, we knew we could do anything. Okay, he said. But you have to do the same for me. I have to study now, she said. Not everybody is a genius like you. You have to remind me that we could do anything. I played Dungeons and Dragons forever. <laughs> forever. Forever. She smiled at him. Thanks for the coffee break. Anytime. He went back to his room, humming a little tune. She wanted him to be her friend after college. It wasn't just a part of his fantasy of all of them doing great things together. It was real. Neither of them would ever let the other one betray their potential. Life after college seemed so far away he almost couldn't imagine it. Kate telling him he was halfway through college was like telling someone he was middle-aged. He was entering the second half of his sophomore year. He wasn't halfway through college. Exams were coming soon, and of course he would get his usual A's, and then they would start the game. His game. Gerald's game. That was the only thing that seemed real at all. Yeah, JJ's well-adjusted. Yeah, he's very healthy. He's fine. Yeah, Yeah, he's good. He's good. Chapter 2. It was the first night of the new game in the caverns. The four of them went there in Kate's car. Since people were always rushing in and out of the dorms, no one paid any attention to them in their duffel bags of equipment which they put into the trunk. They had thrown the dice in J.J.'s room to see what they would take with them, and whatever they needed, J.J. seemed to have ready. They each had a real sword, which was actually a hunting knife and a sheath. That's not a sword. No. And they had lanterns, coins, amulets, food, and costumes. Kate, as Glacia, had her chainmail armor to be put on when they got to the deserted area near the caverns. Pretty sure you want to put that on before you arrive. (laughs) (laughs) No. I guess they, just, they don't want normal people to see them in it and judge them. Right, right, you know. And also wonder what the fuck they're up to. Or just sit in the back of a cramped car wearing chain mail. Yeah, that's a fair point, too. Yeah. Robbie, as Pardue, had his rough brown cloak. Daniel, who was to be Nimble the charlatan, was already dressed in a black turtleneck sweater and slacks. He looked like a cat burglar. It was not in the spirit of a Sounds medieval like he game. like a dork. But he refused to have anything to do with the black leotard J.J. had bought for him. (laughs) J.J. told him he'd change his mind as soon as he found out how the rough, damp passages they might have to crawl through would mess up his clothes, and took the leotard along. They hid the red rabbit in a small clump of trees near the entrance to the caverns. Kate and Robbie dressed, and then the four of them tramped together over the hard, bare ground to the chained opening. They paused. This is the secret kingdom of the evil Vorations, J.J. said. Somewhere within dwells Ak-Oga, the most fiendish monster of them all. He has lived in the depths of this lair for more ages than humans or sprites or dwarfs can know. As great and awesome as is his wickedness, so is the greatness and awesomeness of his treasure. Shall you enter? No, yes, we're good. They said, <laughs> "Yeah, wouldn't that be great?" Like, now you, you know spend what? Spend all the time getting Honestly, out here. <laughs> um, we're good. Let's just yeah. go back to the dorms. Yeah, this sucks. We're out of here. <laughs> Fuck this, you, JJ. I've, I've just had a moment of clarity and realized this is a real bad idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is very stupid, and I'm not doing it. <laughs> they took a last look at the black sky overhead, filled with bright stars, and then they ducked under the chain, entered the caverns, and lit their kerosene lamps. Kate's heart turned over. This place was such a blend of all the fantasies she had invented and reality that for a moment she almost felt she was losing her grip on what was real and what was not. Even the smell of homeless piss. 
<laughs> Except for the lights of their lanterns, the blackness was so vast and absolute that she was not sure she would have the courage to go another step. It was worse than the darkness of the laundry room when that man was trying to kill her, because in the laundry room she had some idea of where things were. But here, all was new. Something obviously happened to Kate at yeah, some point that we... Yeah, uh, bits that we skipped. Yeah. The lamplight touched the shiny black walls with the glitter of gold. I like that sound. Ancient stalactites and stalagmites like stone icicles. The faraway drip of unseen water. The musty smell of evil. Why, why is there evil? <laughs> like, why evil. are you smelling evil, Kate? You're in Funny a cavern. Thing. There, there's not actually <laughs> Ak Oga, the most fiendish no. monster of them all. Funny thing, evil just happens to smell exactly like stalactites. Mm, and bad shit. I figured evil just smelled like musty old cave. <laughs> but worst of all, that darkness. In that darkness, you could lose your sense of direction and wander in circles until you lost consciousness. That is how darkness works. Mm. She was terrified. She drew a deep breath and said nothing. Now, J.J. moved lightly to a corner of the small vaulted room and lit a large battery-powered lantern, the kind used at campsites, which he had put there before they came. It gave the room a reassuring glow, but equally important, it made it possible for him to read his challenge module, see the throw of the dice. You're going to lose your fucking dice. Yeah, I hope he has a dice tray. Yeah. And for all of them to be able to chart the maze with their pencils and graph paper and mark wherever they were at any given time. And that's an interesting thing. That's their, uh, like, in this version of D&D, they actually draw the map out. Yeah. That's something we used to do old school in, like, second ed days that doesn't really happen anymore. Right. That was always fun. They were looking around in awe. Kate glanced at Daniel and Robbie. She couldn't tell if they were afraid or not. Daniel looked fascinated, and Robbie transfixed. She didn't want to be the only one who was scared to death, and if she was, she certainly didn't want them to know it. She tightened her hand on her sword as if it could give her some protection. There was no need to sit in their customary circle to ask the maze controller where they were. They were there. Which way shall we go? Daniel asked the group. Right, Kate said, to the water. She tried to will herself deeper into the game, to become Glacia, no longer Kate. Glacia wouldn't be afraid. A part of her was thinking that the sound of water perhaps led to a hidden pool and that J.J. would want them to see this, and so he would have put inducements in that other chamber, perhaps some charm or treasure. The other part was trying to block out J.J., and to make this game, which was real, as real as the imaginary one they had played in the dorm. She felt that separating the real from the fantasy was a way of keeping her sanity, but if she didn't let herself get into the game, it wouldn't be any fun. This is very apparent that the person writing this has never played Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <clears throat> just like, like listening to them try to explain how the madness creeps in. I just like, what the, the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Glacia. I am Glacia. Why do I always hold back? I'm always afraid, pretending I'm not doing things to test myself. I am Glacia. And I have sworn to seek out the evil monster, Ak Oga and seize the treasure. Glacia turned right with the others and walked with very gingerly steps toward the sound of the dripping water. They went through a narrow tunnel and then came out upon a large room with a black pool at one end. It was breathtaking. There was something eternal about this place. She felt she had dreamed that bottomless black pool a thousand times. She felt the danger singing through her blood, and the mystery, the fantasy, the sheer beauty of something that was at the same time so menacing. She shone her lantern around the corners of the room and screamed. A human skeleton lay propped against the wall, lying in an attitude of exhausted despair. It that wasn't mood. the remains of one of the students who had vanished so long ago. Those bones had been found. What, what if was... JJ posed a skeleton so it was just like waving? Like, hey, 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 <laughs> It was someone else. Oh, God. It could be them. Glacia the fighter never screamed in fear. Alas, Pardu said sadly, who could that be? Some wanderer, perhaps, on a mission such as ours. More than anything, I want it to be the, the, the laughing skeleton from the last unicorn. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 having an existential crisis, David? 
constantly. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. It's... What are we doing? Be careful, Nimble the charlatan warned. It could be a trick. Sometimes these skeletons have power. It could be full of bees. Just as he spoke, the empty eye sockets of the skull glittered with a mad light, all greenish and skittering. The dice clicked softly on the stones. What do you choose to do? the maze controller asked, his voice coming disembodied from the shadows of the black room. Is it evil? Nimble asked. No. Is it helpful then? Pardu asked. Perhaps. It's a skeleton. <laughs> it's calcium. <laughs> yes. It's, it's bones. It's full of delicious cream filling. Glacia remembered another adventure from a long time ago. We will have to touch it, she said. On the butt. Trying to keep her voice steady and calm. The glittering eyes may show us a clue if we turn the head. I am afraid to disturb the bones of those who rest in peace, Pardu said in his kind, reverent tones. Oh yeah, you know, a body left out in the open that all its flesh rotted away until the bones were left exposed to the elements. That's resting in peace. It is a sacrilege. I am not afraid, Glacia said. She strode to the skeleton and touched the head with the tips of her fingers. Her stomach churned. Slowly, slowly, she moved the skull to either side hoping there might be some magic to open a trap door or show up invisible writing. Sorry, David, Nothing. Just, just real quick, want to throw this out to all the Spoony fans. Beware the sacrilege. Continue, please. Okay. Then, suddenly, as if it were on wires, the entire skeleton rose swiftly in the air and flew away into the dark above her. <laughs> ah! That's awesome. <laughs> the sound came from her own throat and from her companions. Awe, terror, fascination. A gasp, sharpening into a shriek. Behind where the skeleton had been lying, there were tiny luminous letters written on the wall. Who among us can read these? Pardu asked. Nimble the charlatan walked closer and looked at the letters. Then he turned, his eyes shining with triumph. I can, he said. They are the ancient runes of my people. I learned them as a child, and I still remember some of them. It says, eat of the bitter herb. Is it a trick? Glacia asked. No, it's just edibles. <laughs> you want to go slow or you'll get to a bad place for like five hours. Yeah. Where is the herb? Will it give us wisdom or kill us? Man. <laughs> <laughs> God First, it. we must find it, Nimble said. Let us search this room and then go on. Oh, look, mushrooms. Consume them. <laughs> Glacia. You're going to have a real bad time in this was. cave. Yeah, don't eat the cave mushrooms. <laughs> All right, you know, just remember, all mushrooms are edible. Some of them are even edible more than once. Yeah. First, we must find it, Nimble said. Let us search this room and then go on. Glacia, proud and strong as she was, was glad Nimble had become the new member of their band. He was so calm and sure. She felt a great confidence by his side. Irresistibly drawn to the black waters of the pool, she knelt and dropped a small stone into its depths. The stone sank away and disappeared instantly. But be careful of the water, she said. I think it has a hypnotic lure. If you feel it calling to you, Nimble said. Just jump in. Have a good time. Go nuts. Take my hand. You should tie a rope around your waist for when you go in. That way, when you're sucked under by an underwater tide and <laughs> drown, we can pull your corpse out more easily. <laughs> All of us, link yourselves together. That way, if one goes in, we all go in. <laughs> Form a human chain. Is this book kind of boring, or is it yes. just my incredibly short attention span? No, yes. like, judging from last week, and this book was talking about the characters and their personal struggles, and we're learning about them, that was at least interesting. Right. This is like, maybe this would be interesting if you don't know what D&D &D and LARPing is. Maybe. But it's it's like, it's just so much nonsense i don't know i mean honestly like i don't think the book is explaining it very well or or sure. expressing it very well but all in all like the experience that they're having mm -hmm. to me sounds like a shitload of fun it does sound fun don't get me wrong going into a cave and having a skeleton on strings leap up in the air <laughs> having a fun immersive haunted house larp hybrid like that's a delightful concept and not, not just that but also being in a cave would most definitely be terrifying but when you have the knowledge that this book is trying to 
pin all of this onto Dungeons and Dragons, it loses a lot of the impact. Sure. For me, I think it's just something about the way it's written. It's that's very just plotting. Causing it to, yeah, just slide off my brain. <laughs> this concept does sound fun as hell. Again, I, I you know, a hybrid LARP haunted house in a cave. That sounds like it would rule. Okay, if you're trying to spin this into an anti D and D thing, wouldn't it make more sense that they're in the cave, but they don't recognize the actual real dangers of it because they're so immersed in their fantasy land? And then someone I think falls that's what's and gets... happening. No, like no, they're terrified of the cave because of the actual danger that it represents. Yeah, well, they're just now going in. This is the first time they've been in there, so like I I assume that the real fear will. <laughs> be there at first and then they'll start to get confident right. and like, oh, okay. but let's let's move forward yeah yeah let's keep it going that little bastard jj is a genius Daniel fucking thought, jj admiring and jealous he was annoyed too because jj's funhouse tricks were so simple and yet they worked on everybody's mind even his own he knew how jj had lit up the bulbs in the skull's eye sockets he had immediately figured out the wires and pulleys that made the skeleton fly away and having the ancient runes in Hebrew was both ingenious and irritating. Irritating because he had never thought of doing it. All J.J. had needed to get his hands on was a Passover Haggadah for kids, the one with the translation on the opposite page, and he obviously had. Bitter herbs. Here he was, hoping to make up games for a living after he graduated, and J.J., as a vacation sideline, had created a minor Disneyland. Everything was perfectly thought out, even the way J.J. kept in the shadows whenever he consulted his rules in order not to disturb the reality of what was happening to them. All the time they had been moving about, awestruck, J.J. had been scattering rice to make a trail so they wouldn't lose their sense of direction and get lost. Good idea. He also had a map yeah. and a compass. Daniel took his pad of graph paper and a pencil from his knapsack and began to chart the maze. He put a little mark where they were now, with some symbols denoting the pool and the skeleton in the Hebrew writing, so he would be able to look at the map later and know just which room was which. He wished he had been the one to think of this game. There is nothing to eat in this room, Kate said. She picked up a few grains of the rice J.J. had dropped and looked questioningly at him. No, J.J. said. That's so you won't get lost. Leave it there. Let's move on, Daniel said. They went back through the narrow tunnel into the first room, and then they turned left. Daniel leading the way. Kate followed, and then Robbie. Their lanterns made wavering shadows and glistening light on the walls, where something sparkled in the blackness. Micah, I bet, Daniel thought. J.J. brought up the rear, dragging along his battery-powered lamp, but he had turned it off to make the journey more frightening. What a strange and wonderful place this is, Daniel thought. All this time it was right here, and I never went in to investigate it. A wandering monster, J.J. cried. <laughs> Over there. He switched on his lamp and tossed the dice. A Gorville, followed by three others. Gorville. Gorvils were stupid, soulless, and attacked anything even when they weren't hungry. They were covered with scales, had short webbed arms, huge fangs, and a large eye in the center of their lizard-like foreheads. They were over seven feet tall and vicious. Daniel took out his knife. No his sword. He wanted to get into the game and stop analyzing everything. This was an imaginary Gorville, part of the game he knew, not J.J.'s manufactured theatrical prop. There was no point in being jealous, it was self-destructive. Now he could go into the fantasy on his own terms, not someone else's, and enter the adventure of his own imagination. Oh shit. Kill them, Glacia cried, waving her sword. Kill them, Pardu cried, rushing forward, his sword drawn too. Kill them, Nimble growled fiercely, and stabbed the nearest Gorville again and again. Wouldn't it be funny if they all just started stabbing the fuck out of JJ? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's exactly what I was <laughs> about to say. While it bucked and lunged to kill him with its fangs and its black blood poured in torrents over the floor of the maze. They are all dead, the maze controller <laughs> this is said. not good. Be Knife careful, safety. Glessia warned. There may be more. Well, Indeed, you're not going to roll damage said. dice? Yeah, there was, there was no uh, actual game in this game. They just jumped forward yelling, kill them, and waving knives around. <laughs> and they attacked mm -hmm. the darkness. They did. They did, in fact, attack the darkness. <laughs> <sighs> 
Be careful, Glacia warned. There may be more. Indeed, Pardu said. They will surely come to seek revenge. The noise they made as they died was frightful. Gentle Pardu felt sickened with guilt and remorse as he surveyed the mutilated bodies of the dead monsters. What? They're dumb and soulless. A holy man should resort to violence only when he could not overcome evil with reason or spells. They're dumb and soulless. You can't reason with that. Yeah, they're basically animals. He still had his charms safely tucked in the little leather pouch he wore attached to his belt, and he had not used them. No, he had flung himself into the fray with reckless abandon, as if he were a fighter, which he was not. Which is exactly what you want your healer to do. Holy men had been given their magic spells to compensate for their lack of warlike skills. He could have been killed, and then he would have been of no help to his dear companion. But what really upset him was that he had never known he had this capacity for violence within him. He had been so proud of his goodness. Pride was a sin. One sin led to another, and thus, he supposed, to his violence. Fear leads to anger. I didn't even anger. think. <laughs> I merely acted, like some instinctive beast. He would have to think on this later, when there was time to rest and meditate. He had to pull the evil out of himself, by the roots, um. do penance if need be. You were brave, Pardu, Glacia said. Perhaps foolhardy, Pardu answered sadly. I should have used my smell... <clears throat> I should have used my spell of paralyzation instead. You used that up in the other game, Nimble said. Game? What game? He felt his pouch, looked inside. Where was the Eye of Timor? Don't feel your pouch in public. He felt icy cold. The Eye of Timor, to raise the dead, had been his. He had felt it, seen it. But that had been in a dream. Never mind that the spell of paralyzation was lost, but not this one. No, he had to have it. He needed it. The others had stopped to rest, eat, and drink. They had sandwiches of cheese and meat on thick bread and cold beer. The food stuck in Pardu's throat. Why did his magic spells appear and disappear? Um, real quick, I, uh, I don't consider myself to be, uh, of a, uh, I, I forget what the... Use your what words. The, ...what the term is for, like, not being able to hold your liquor. A lightweight? Yeah, I don't consider myself a lightweight when it comes to beer. If I was in a dank, dark cavern, I would not have one. Like, no, that's the, that's a terrible idea. You're not wrong. But they're also having sandwiches of cheese and meat on thick bread. <laughs> Which does sound delicious. It does sound delicious. Very. It won't do you a whole lot of good if you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> the food stuck in Pardu's throat. <laughs> That's called choking. Quick, he's choking! Oh, man. Do the Heimlich. Instead of, like, doing the Heimlich, they cast spells on him. And he <laughs> dies. Fireball. Fire. <laughs> Why did his magic spells appear and disappear? Was this some kind of punishment for his pride and his secret violence? Why had Nimble said he had already used the spell? He had been traveling for such a long time, and he was so tired. Are there any girls there? Yes. <laughs> He remembered now. He had used the spell of paralyzation to stop the moving stairs long ago. It had been in a different maze. And you didn't take a long rest. Can the I others get a had eaten do? now and were refreshed. They rose to go on, tossing their empty beer cans into the corner. That's, That's rude. That's rude. <laughs> yeah. Take only pictures and leave only footprints. Damn right. He got up too and followed them. I must try harder to be a true holy man, Pardue thought. I must, and I will. So I guess mazes and monsters, if you're a holy man, you're just kind of a Catholic. Yeah, that's fine. That way, like, yeah. It's... JJ looked at his watch. It was midnight. Really? The hours had gone by so fast he could hardly believe it. Especially since this had they been seemed one to have of the happiest so nights of his life. <laughs> Everything he had planned had been just right. He'd loved it when they screamed. It was like the screams of the audience at a Hitchcock movie. He congratulated himself for keeping the levels of reality and fantasy perfectly mixed. Is that a thing that happens? Do people scream in Hitchcock movies? Sure, they used to. Yeah. Um, oh, I've okay. been to horror movies where people in the audience, like in the theater, where people, you know, scream at the jump scares and react that way. Okay, yeah. I guess I was just being a dick. He had been right not to try to make any silly monsters out of papier mache. That would have destroyed the whole illusion. 
The game was perfect, just as it was. <clears throat> the best monsters were the ones in the mind. And I think that's where we're going to stop. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a perfect notion to end that's on. That's a good note to end on. Of just, like, this book thinking that it's saying something. I mean, <laughs> aside from Joe's rather astute observation that they didn't really do anything, I guess probably that you, you can't break the uh, immersion of something like that when you're in the book trying to make this seem really, really, like... Had they stopped to describe how then they brought out their pencils and all rolled dice and right. jet, joked about what they were doing to stab these soulless monsters, sure. you're not going to buy that Robbie's losing his shit and getting all guilty yeah. about killing no, monsters fair. that didn't actually exist. And I, I see what you're saying, and I get that, it, but it, it, maybe we would have come to that conclusion if it wasn't so abundantly clear that this person has never played D&D and they have no idea what it is. <laughs> sure no i mean that's yeah although they seem to know enough about it to be shaving the serial numbers off right i mean i figure when this book was written the author would have done ex some some research at yeah, least enough yeah. research to uh be able to come up with their own like xp of it sure I think it really says something about your authentic, well, not necessarily your authenticity, but uh, your qualification when, as as Joe was quoting, the Dead Alewives is a more accurate representation of what D&D actually is than this. <laughs> well, that whole bit, like that Dead Alewives bit, I think was in direct response to the oh, satanic really? panic thing and the whole like because yeah if you remember the that start makes a of lot it, of sense actually they start by talking about the dark and threatening world of mm -hmm. dungeons and dragons or whatever and then you cut to just, just a bunch of nerds being fucking nerds right <laughs> <laughs> which is ultimately like i do agree and i do think and i i do in my heart of hearts believe that playing Dungeons and Dragons, or not D and D specifically, but just a tabletop role playing game, mm -hmm. is good for people. Yeah, I think it is. I th you build friendships. It's creative problem solving. Mm -hmm. You're doing a little bit of math. You're engaging your imagination. Yeah, it's you know free form storytelling and improvisational theater. It's it's got a lot of really good positive qualities to it. Yeah. And not everyone that plays is a giant nerd anymore. No, not at all. But <laughs> like I made those that jokes, that jokes. I could <laughs> talk smart with my mouth. Those brain. joke, that jokes, <laughs> <laughs> them jokes. Because JJ is clearly a giant fucking dork, and I wouldn't want to hang out with him. Oh yeah, but but yeah, no, you're absolutely right. But like the reputation of D and D players all being giant nerds is probably well earned. Right. Um, most of my life, the people that I played D and D with were either gigantic, socially awkward nerd people, mm -hmm. or like metalhead stoners. Yeah, or a combination of the two. Sure. It's not even really an insult as much as it is just kind of a a lighthearted observation. Yeah. Yeah. Like really, the most unrealistic part of this whole thing is that all of these characters in this book mm -hmm. are just kind of average normal people like right they're the and sort of people who might play D, &D now. <laughs> right yeah oh no they're all really excited to play every week yeah no one ever misses a session because they just don't feel like coming or because something got in the way like right. uh, they'll move mountains to play D, D. that's i want this yeah shit you imagine having a dm that cares enough about the story that he actually goes to the effort of Making props. Putting all of your lives in danger. Acquiring yeah. a, a real hum, human remains. Yeah. A, a bartering for human skeleton. Remains. I don't like what they're doing because this is clearly, you know, propaganda and it's, you know, it's whatever. But like as a book, I was almost interested. And then the longer it went on. Yeah. Something yeah. about the, the way that it's written just lost my attention. For me, I feel like it was the lack of confidence on the writer. Like, they were trying so hard to sell this concept, and, like, to the point that it comes off like a snake oil salesman. Sure. 
And like, I don't know, like, I don't even think it's that it's written within it. Like, because I was trying to judge it as a book, kind of divorce my brain from, oh, this is propaganda. And even then, like, I, I don't know, I was bored. It's not even <laughs> worth my contempt because it's propaganda. Because it's such a boring book. Watch the movie, if anything. Yeah, I was into learning about the characters on our first episode on it. I, 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 I was kind of into that, but this was just troublesome. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think, David? You seemed a little more engaged than we were. I don't know. I mean, it's not... It, it's not great. Mm. It's not. And it's built on, I think, just a... It's, it's begging the question. It's, you know, coming to the whole scenario, this entire book, this entire storyline is built around the premise that there are dangers to playing your fantasy role playing game. Mm -hmm. And so they've already decided that it's a dangerous and terrible thing that will make the potentially unstable people become even more unstable and these normal nice healthy kids with their futures in front of them get ruined because of this game mm -hmm. this so-called game <laughs> um i don't know like and it maybe that's just the weight of this book on itself like right. the reputation of this book definitely precedes it Right. If you're a gamer, if you play any kind of D&D &D or D&D &D adjacent thing and you have for a while, you've probably heard of this. And so it's got a shadow, you know sure. what I mean? And whether it's deserved or not, and maybe the movie, it's been a while since I've seen the movie. I don't know if the movie does a better or a worse job. Of, the movie is very funny. Yeah, but it's just not all that interesting. Ultimately. No, like, right. Yeah, I agree. I know where it's going. Mm -hmm. I know what they're trying to say. And I don't feel particularly engaged right. enough to know how they get there when this could have been a short story. Yeah. yeah. I agree. And maybe it would have been more interesting if this was happening to younger kids who all were in an environment, like an abusive environment, and they were literally using D, D as escaping from reality and so like and it, and it wouldn't be at that point it wouldn't be so much a commentary on the game as much as it would be on mental health but yeah. maybe that would be a more that could have been concept. a more interesting story i agree I, I actually was had something similar to say that you know even as someone who's kind of entrenched in that nerd culture if this book were less a propaganda tale and i'm just going to reiterate your point and more just this was a group of friends who played this Dungeons and Dragons analog and and one of them you know because of underlying issues you know the game exacerbated those pro like that could have been an interesting story but I think because this book had the agenda that it had and maybe because the writer lacked the competence to tell that story it kind of fell flat you know I, I feel like what we might have been better served doing is doing some sort of like uh not necessarily a live reading but like like uh we could have done the the chick track with us doing <laughs> the voices of characters and you could have put the the images up that could be funny that might be be something fun to do at some point <laughs> i think that could be really fun so I, I might have a conversation about doing that at some point that might be funny yeah so it's i guess in terms of entertainment this book's greatest enemy is its banality yeah that's a good, I think that's a good point to end on, unless somebody else has anything to add. No, I think that pretty much covers it. I sure. mean, I'm just, I went through the rest of part three and I'm skimming through part four now. And basically what happens for the remainder of the book is that Robbie goes steadily more crazy and becomes more and more convinced that he is actually Pardu and has to be a holy man. And I guess probably ultimately, I don't know, disappears into the caves or something. Sure. Hilariously enough, with that being the fulcrum of his insanity, you could just as easily make the argument that it was the religion that made him go crazy. Sure. Right? <laughs>
Uh, so that's that. That's yeah. mazes and monsters. Yeah, I have. The most time. frightening monsters are the ones inside your mind. Yup. If you die in the game, you die in real life. <laughs> uh, so I guess you that... run a fucking rough table, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you roll the one, you lose a finger. Uh, so I guess that being said, I, all that's left to do is remind you to go to wegiveyoubrainworms.com where you can support us financially on Patreon. We are member supported by viewers like you. And uh, you can jump into our funky fresh discord and ask us what the fuck we're doing. Because <laughs> maybe it'll prompt us to consider that. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll actually do some self-examination. Uh I don't Whatever. know what you're talking about. I examine myself every day. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. two or three times a day. Right. But yeah, um, to all, all the listeners out there, deeply sorry. We're so sorry for what we just did. So sorry. All right. I'm going to push the, the appropriate buttons. This has been a production of Brainworms Presents. Any copyrighted content contained within is used for purposes of review. Brainworms podcast is David Combs, Kane Magdalene, Christian Schaefer, and Joseph Wells. The theme music is HodgePodge No. 1 by Brian Davis. If you like what you heard and can support us and learn about our other projects at WeGiveYouBrainWorms.com or by leaving a review on your favorite listening app. Play Dungeons and Dragons forever. <laughs> forever. Forever.